Good morning, Calvary Chapel Concord. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Father, we love you so much, Lord, and we're thankful that, Lord, you've afforded us the opportunity and the freedom, Lord, just to come and to worship you, to sing your praises, Lord, and to know that you inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. Come, we, we, we just ask, Lord, and fill this time of praise and worship. Fill this time of study and of fellowship and koinonia. And Lord, let your truth ring out so loud and so clear uh, as we study your word, Lord, as we are equipped to do the work of the ministry in so many different ways. And Father, we pray that just for the soul that, Lord, you would bring uh, just a wholeness and a healthiness, Lord. And Father, we pray for the others in the church that are sick today, Lord, and just dealing with different adversity. And we pray, Lord, whether it be physical or spiritual or emotional, that, Lord, you would just uh, be that stopgap, Lord. And Father, just minister to the needs as they are presented, Lord. And Father, that you would just be glorified as we just lift your name on high and we praise your holy name. Lord, what a wonder, what a, a joy it is, Lord, just to be with you today and to know you. And Lord, we just pray that you'd fill this place with your presence, with your Holy Spirit poured out upon your people, Lord. Draw us close to you as we draw near to you, Lord. And Father, be honored and glorified in all things. We love you, we praise you, and we just ask these things now in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Blessed be your name, the man that is plentiful, may your stream of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, the man in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Thank you. 
love that's never failing.
of all love songs I want to give to you So I let my words be you Jesus I
You're all that I ever wanted. You're all that I ever need. And though I wasn't looking, you were after me. For your love for me is eternal. And this I.
Father God, we can only imagine that day when we stand in your presence, Lord, face to face. We'll have the mind of Christ. Oh God, no sin, nothing, nothing that would cause us to shy away in shame, Lord. Everything fully open to you, Lord God, and you open to us. Oh, that day. We look forward to that day, God. And in the meantime, your word says that the house of the righteous is full of riches. Father God, you're our riches. You're our treasure. We're your house, and you live in us. God, that's such a mighty, mighty blessing we can't even fathom. Lord, we come before you and acknowledge that we're sinful and that we're made of the dust, we're, we're flesh, we're of the earth, Lord, and you're heavenly, and you bridge that gap through your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can walk in the holiness that you gave us through your blood, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you so much. We pray and ask, God, that you would be high and lifted up in this place today. God, that your word would go out in power and in truth, that it would melt our hearts, and mold us into your image, God, so that as we walk out those doors and into the world, we will shine your light. We will reflect you, God, to those around us who are in darkness, who need that light so desperately. Lord, we pray that you would lead us to those, that you would open doors, God, that you would give us your boldness to speak the truth in love. Lord, we honor you, we praise you, we worship you, we glorify you now. We magnify your mighty, beautiful, precious name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Love one another, guys.
They fixed the squeak. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're going to be back in Psalm 78 again today. Uh, Jim's not here, so I'll be reading again. And we'll pray for Jim when we're done with this. Um, We're going to start with verse 21. And I'll read the odd if you guys can read the even. So, and we started off last time with the questions. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? And we continue today. Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. Men ate angels' food, and he sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south side. He also rained meat on them like dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas. And he let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings. So they ate and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. The wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. In spite of this, they still blessed him and did not believe in his wondrous work. Therefore their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. When they slew them, they then sought him and they returned and sought earnestly for God. For they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned in their way, and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. Amen. Aren't you glad that God's promises are based on upon him not on us so let's pray Lord I I do want to just lift up Jim before you today and Lord just ask for your healing touch on his body and Lord just uh, for Fern and just the the diligence and care and and, and consuming um, time and and energy she uses to take care of him Lord just uh, strengthen her as well Lord we praise you that he does have her to help lift him up, Lord. And Lord, just uh, others within the body that are hurting today, Lord, Jim, the other Jim, and his back, Lord. Um, I just want to lift that up to you. And, and other requests I don't know about, Lord. Just We're so glad to be your people and that, to know that your hand is upon us and that you care for us and you won't let us stumble. Lord, I just ask that you lift us up today. And Lord, just uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts to your word today. And Lord, just uh, fill Pastor Joe with your spirit as he gives forth your word to us, Lord. And let it just sink into our hearts and so that we'll be doers of your word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. How's everybody? Okay. You guys can see? I can see you. That's more important. Let me get popped up here just a second. All right. All right. All right, let's open your Bibles to John chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 21 this morning. And we're going to be talking about our Lord walking on water. Amen? Amen. So Jesus has done an incredible thing. 
At this point, he just got through feeding a huge multitude of people, at least 5,000 men, and that doesn't count the women and the children. And he did it all with five small loaves of bread and two small fish. And we're about to see now Jesus walk on the water. Someone might say, by this time, Jesus has acquired rock star status. He's being chased across the country by people that want what he has to offer. Not necessarily what they need to receive from him, but what they think is most important. So we're going to look at that. Now, these days, walking on water is kind of used as a standard of perfection, right? Well, you know that guy, he can walk on water, you know, just where he's at in the hierarchy, if you would. And in fact, some of the ways people can use it this, this, this idea, if you would, this concept can make you a little bit sick, if you would, but we're going to look at someone now who's the real deal, who really walked on water. Amen? Amen. Okay. Sorry about that. So beginning in verse 14, then those men... When they had seen a sign, or the sign that Jesus did, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. What's he talking about? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses prophesied that a prophet would come who was like but greater than himself. Those who <clears throat> witnessed the miracle that had just taken place thought for sure that Jesus was this prophet of whom Moses spoke. Therefore, verse 15, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, although the crowd referred to Jesus as a prophet back in verse 14, and they desired to make him king in verse 15, what they failed to acknowledge was that their real need was for a priest. The real need was for Jesus, the Christos, the Christ, the anointed one. The one who would not only be the promised prophet and king of kings, but he would also have to be the great high priest who would lay down his life as a sacrifice for the sin of mankind. And for this reason, it says our Lord perceiving the crowd's misconception, misunderstanding of what his purpose really was, is that he was about to do. Jesus withdrew himself and he departed away from that place. Now, departed in the Greek is to withdraw or to, if you would, leave space. You could say that Jesus needed some space. And so we're told that he left the room, so to speak. He did not want to, at this point in juncture, seem to want the people to make him king. It was not his time yet. It was not time for that to take place. I find it somewhat ironic in the day in which we live, when we know leaders in, that we have, whether it be in uh, executive legislature or uh, the other branch, <laughs> Um, but they're vying for that position. We know we're having a debate come up not too soon. I think it's towards the end of, of August. And they're lining up. You know, you show the panel and you've got like, I don't know, 15, 18 people that are coming to debate on issues and such. But really, ultimately, what they're doing is they're doing a job interview, basically, right? They want the job of running this country. They want you to vote for them. And so they're doing whatever they can do, uh, squeezing babies' hands and everything that you could imagine to, in order to get your vote and to get you to, to vote for them. And again, it's somewhat ironic when you have people lining up for it that here Jesus walks away from it. I don't want to have anything to do with that, he would say. Why? Why? Well, he knows that they're following him for the wrong reasons. And that's a, that's a big reason. They like the free lunch. You know, 
Who doesn't like a free lunch? But they liked the free lunch that Jesus gave. And in chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. That's the only reason you're here. It's the only reason you're hanging out. Which begs the question, what is the right reason? What's the right reason to follow Jesus? God's kingdom is coming and you ought to be ready, number one. But getting ready involves a change in your life. It involves realizing that you're sinful. Realizing that you are unprepared, unacceptable for God's kingdom. And you need to turn your life around. That's the whole deal about John the Baptist. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He was getting people ready to follow Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 1 verse 4 and verse 5, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. That's what John the Baptist was all about. Not only that, but that's what Jesus preached. Again, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Now after John was put in the prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so again, believe and repent, receive what it is that God has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' message was repent, which means turn around. Go in one direction, you stop, put the brakes on, turn around, and go the exact opposite direction as hard and as fast as ever you have done. Turn around. Sometimes people become Christians because they hear that Christianity helps people. They hear that it's a way to get to a better life, perhaps. And some people have even the audacity to tell us that you'll become wealthy and you'll never be sick if you follow Jesus. I don't know about that. But that's exactly the mindset of the crowd that Jesus is running from at this point in juncture, trying and seeking to avoid. We know that God's kingdom is coming. We know that Jesus is going to return. And the question really is today, are you ready to meet him? You know, what, what is your motivation? What is it that, that we're to be doing? Are you ready to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that you ought to be living your life the way that He wants you to live it? Not the way that you want to live it, but the way that He wants you to, to live it. And so he goes on in verse 16, he says, Now, when the evening had come, His disciples went down to the sea. So they've had a full day of ministry. And it's taken place on the hillside there along the Sea of Galilee. And they had come over to this location, if you remember, prior to the feeding of the 5,000. They had come over by boat, and now they're going to leave by boat. In Matthew chapter 14, it records for us that it was Jesus who made the disciples leave. It says, well, he sent the people home. Matthew 14, 22, actually. Immediately it says, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he dealt with the multitudes. Now, it's possible that Jesus was trying to rescue the disciples from getting caught up in the crowd's reaction of seeking to make him king. He didn't want to get entangled. Some have suggested that Jesus was concerned that if the movement got out of hand, that the Romans might come down hard on them and discipline them or correct them, if you would. However, while Jesus is sending the disciples away from the trouble and away from the, 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 the stirring up of what was taking place, he is also sending them to another place. And that would be he's sending them into the storm. So taking them away from the crowd, he's finding them into the boat, off into the Galilee Sea, off into a storm. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. In verse 17, then it goes on, it says, they got in the boat 
they went over the sea towards Capernaum. Now perhaps it was to turn the focus of his disciples to a spiritual rather than an earthly kingdom that Jesus distanced his disciples from the crowd. It's possible he didn't want them getting caught up in that at all. Uh, but here he is, he's sending them to Capernaum. As for the boat, we have a clue as the kind of boat that it is. Um, those kinds of boats that were used on the lake in Jesus' time. They actually found one in the late 80s at the Genosar Kibbutz. And it's now on display in a museum there. But these boats were about 30 feet long and about 8 feet wide. And so into the boat they went away from the Lord as the Lord took care of the crowd. And off they went towards Capernaum. The Sea of Galilee is, is a pretty, basically a, a huge lake. It's about seven and a half miles wide at its widest and about 12 and a half miles long. Usually it's pretty calm and it's pretty flat. Good for water skiing, you know. But there have been, there somewhere near the town of Bethsaida and now Jesus sends them towards Capernaum. However, they weren't moving real fast. For verse 17 goes on to say it was already dark and Jesus had not yet come to him. The Lord had not either caught up to him in a little rowboat or whatnot or walking around the side or, or whatever they thought that he was going to do in order to catch up with them. But here it was getting dark already and he wasn't there. And I wonder, the darkness as it's setting in, Oftentimes, we get to points in our life where it's somewhat semi-dark. And maybe you're not sensing the presence of the Lord in your situation. But know this, omnipotence, authority, power, and supremacy can afford to wait. As God does his work in his perfect timing and in his perfect way, he has a reason for doing the things that he's doing. He doesn't always let us in on that reason. But he has the reasons, his reasons for having us do things and having us do them in a certain prescribed way in order to accomplish his purpose and his plan. And so here the darkness sets in. They haven't seen the Lord yet. I mean, did the Lord actually really say that he would meet them? And I wonder why John notes it in this way. Jesus had not yet come to them or had not come to them. Perhaps he told them that he was going to meet them. We don't really know. But when it started to get dark, they're, they're, they're going. But as they were going, something else begins to transpire. And verse 18 tells us that the sea arose, woke up, arose from asleep is the word in the Greek, because a great wind was blowing. The wind speaks of a very strong, tempestuous wind. And the area, as you look at it, was it's interesting geographically. It was situated in, in such a way that it could lead to sudden winds and storms. The lake itself was about 600 feet below sea level. And it's surrounded by hills all around it. And so it wasn't unusual for the west blowing wind to be picked up in the afternoon and, and to grow in intensity, if you would, there on the lake. It, it would happen periodically. In fact, quite often it would happen. And we're going to find out here as we continue through the account is that Jesus is not only the Savior in the storm, but also the sender of the storm. He's not only one that can save you out of the blowing wind and the forceful winds, but he's also the one that sends them in the first place. And just as he did with his disciples, he will send you into a storm knowingly and lovingly, guys, not spitefully, not trying to make your life difficult, but in as loving a way as he could possibly do, in, in, in a, a knowing as a way as possible. 
He will send you oftentimes and send us oftentimes into that position where a storm will be sent into our life. And everything falls apart. And you know those times. You know, um, whether it's the, the job that you lose or the cancer that you contract or, you know, any number of things we know come our direction and into our life. And so he's not only the savior in that storm, but he's also the stender, sender, which means that he can prescribe it just exactly the intensity that he knows that we need to have within our life. And just as he does with the disciples here in our text and in our story, he will send you into a storm lovingly and knowingly when he sees that you're about to get pulled into the mentality of the crowd. So again, going back to our presumption that Jesus is responding and reacting to the crowd that is not going after the Lord for the right reason. They're going after the food or after the, the, the marvel, if you would, of, of what you know, the, the, the miracles are producing or are bringing to their direction. And as they're looking at this and coming maybe perhaps for the wrong reason, the Lord says, man, I got to get these guys away from this this crowd because he didn't want them getting sucked into the mentality of the crowd. What does that remind you of? Present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Amen? And be not, what? Conformed, molded, pressed in to the world's form, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Renew your mind. That's what the Lord is trying to, to, to get his disciples away from. You guys, go down, get in the boat, set out. I'm going to get rid of the crowd. I'll be right back. All right? Can you imagine? You know, when I, I was doing law enforcement chaplaincy. We did a lot of ride-alongs and things. And I remember one time that there was this huge party that was transpiring down in Alamo at one of these just huge houses and we came into it and basically we had, they had sent one unit out which was us for a party of about three to four hundred and uh, you know I was, I was kind of looking at, at, at my deputy that I was with and I was going like what are you going to do you know and he saw this worried face on my you know look on my face and he, he just kind of said, don't worry, Joe, watch. And he went down a little about, tell he's about maybe, I don't know, 100 yards away from the, the house, flipped the lights on, flipped the sirens on, and it was just like, I mean, it was like an ant pile got stirred up and just, you know, they're going all over the place. And that's that's that mentality, if you would, of the crowd. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be a part of that. And so Jesus wasn't there. It was getting dark. They said, let's go. And you see there in verse 19, so when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And guess what? They're afraid. Good reason probably, right? You wouldn't know what to think. You know, you... What? Yeah, I've been checking my glasses out. I was like, what? But when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw him walking and drawing near the boat. So he's kind of angling himself to intercept them, perhaps. Three or four miles, literally... 20 to 30 stadia, or a stadion. And a stadion is the length of an ancient race course, which is about 600 feet back then. And if they started west of Bethsaida, and you remember that the coastline in Jesus' day was a little bit further north, 
then three miles puts them at about three quarters of the way to Capernaum. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, it tells us that it was during the fourth watch, sometime between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning when all this was taking place. And so they saw him. And that's a very attentive saw. That was like jaw-dropping saw. That was like, what is going on? And when you see that word in Scripture, you, you need to think of somebody whose mouth is just jaws dropped open and they're checking this out. There was a mother that was watching her four-year-old child play outside in a small plastic pool that was half filled with water. And he was happily just walking back and forth across the pool, making splashes, when suddenly he stopped and he stepped out of the pool and he began to scoop water up out of the pool with a pail. And the mother said, why are you pouring the water out, Jimmy? Because my teacher said Jesus walked on water and this water's not working. The pastor, the youth pastor and the worship leaders, they all went fishing together in the, one morning. The latter two had been to the spot many times and decided to bring the pastor along with them. They'd been out a couple hours when the youth pastor remembered that he left his canteen on the shore. So he stepped out of the boat and proceeded to step lightly across the water, got his canteen, and he walked back, started drinking. After a while, the worship leader ran out of bait, so he decided to go back to the shore and find some grubs he too stepped out of the boat, walked across the water, got what he needed, came back. The whole while the pastor was watching quietly and intently to the two as they walked on water. His eyes were round with amazement, but not wanting to be outdone, he quickly thought of some reason to get out of the boat also. And he announced to the group he was getting a little tired of fishing and thought he'd go get his Bible and, and read quietly in the boat while the other two continued their fishing. And so he stepped out, and sure enough, he sank right to the bottom. The worship leader looked at the youth pastor and said, you know, we probably should have told them where the rocks are. I say those two things because, number one, we know that it wasn't because Jesus had special water. That wasn't the reason. We also know that it wasn't because Jesus knew where the rocks were. Jesus is unique. He's awesome. He's powerful. And verse 19 says he was drawing near to the boat. It tells us that it looked like he was going to walk right by him, perhaps. But we also see that they were afraid. Phobio. To put to flight by terrifying, to scare away, to be afraid. Mark chapter 6, verse 49 tells us that they thought it was the ghost. And so it was evidently scary. So why did... Jesus waits so long before showing up. You can say that, you can't really say that he was punishing them. After all, he was the one that sent them into the storm. I'm not sure we know the reason, but here's what we do know. We do know that we're to keep rowing. If Jesus says to get into the boat and row, then we get into the boat and we row. There are going to be times when we have to learn to stay focused on the task that Jesus has given to us even all night if we have to. Sometimes we just don't understand our circumstances. We don't understand all the ins and outs of what God's doing. But we know this, that we are to keep going. If Jesus says go to the other side, we're to keep going until we get to the other side. We're to keep rowing. The Word of God tells us in Psalm chapter 30, verse 56. It says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, but keep going, keep rowing, keep paddling. I love the verse in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. I see a lot of believers these days losing heart, giving up, going back to the old ways going back to their old stuff. God says, don't grow weary while doing well. 
For in due season you shall reap if you don't lose heart. I was looking at a page from John Wesley's diary when he started the Wesleyan ministry. And the diary, interestingly enough, read as follows. Sunday, a.m., May 5th, preached in St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. This is a guy that God used in incredibly ways and to large groups. Sunday, Sunday p.m., May 5th, preached at St. John's. Deacon said, get out, stay out. Sunday a.m., May 12th, preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. Sunday p.m., May 12th, preached at St. George's. Kicked out again. Sunday a.m., May 19th, preached at St. Somebody Else's. Deacons called a special meeting, said I couldn't return. Sunday p.m., May 19th, preached on the street. Got kicked off the street. Sunday a.m., May 26th, preached in the meadow, chased out of the meadow as the bull was turned loose during the services. These are his actual entries on his, on his diary. Talk about wanting to serve the Lord but getting dissuaded. And then Sunday a.m., June 2nd, preached at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. And then Sunday p.m., June 2nd, afternoon service, preached in the pastor. 10,000 people came to hear. Go figure. I think the lesson is obvious. Keep rowing. Stay faithful. Keep on doing. Keep the main thing the main thing, right? Jesus Christ and Him crucified within our life. And because God is with us, notice verse 20, but He said unto them, it is I, do not be afraid. It is I. Because God is with us, we need not be afraid. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 4, you know it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. If God be for you, who can be against you, right? Nobody, guys. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, gives us one more little twist to the story. And it talks about, Matthew does, Peter getting out of the boat and trying to walk on water. We'll leave that little tidbit for another time. But know that that's an integral part of this whole story. But in the midst of your own struggling, in the midst of your own toiling, in the problems and the things that you're going through, guys, remember that if God is for you, who can be against you? Jesus knows the perfect time to come to you. He knows the perfect time to come and to whisper in your ear, it is I, be not afraid. That's what he's doing for the disciples. That's what are the apostles. That's what he's doing for you guys and will do for you guys if you trust in him with all your heart. Not try to figure things out, but just find what it is that he wants you to do and where it is that he wants you to do it. And listen for that, it is I, be not afraid. And understand that it won't be a minute too early, it won't be a moment too late, it'll be exactly the time that it needs to take place within your life. Verse 21, then they willingly received him into the boat. Jesus didn't jump into the disciples' boat. He didn't force himself onto board. The disciples received him, it says, willingly. In the same way, so too you and I, we can say either, nice to see you, Lord, but I'm going to bring this thing to shore myself. Or we can, like the disciples, say, I can, I can willingly and wisely welcome him into the boat. Come on in, Lord. Take, a, take your feet off. Take your load off. Rest a little bit. And it says they willingly received him. You know, the disciples... They actually had a choice. They could have let Jesus pass by them. They could have let this ghost go and, and kept him out of the boat. But they made the choice to receive him. And so often, we've seen several times in the Gospel of John that one of the biggest issues that keep men from God is the will. That's one of the biggest things that keep men from God. Why? Because man 
wants to be self-willed. They don't like to think that they need to give up control of his li- their lives to God. Oh, I, I can do it. I got this handled. And they're self-willed. Jesus, in the same vein, challenged the man who had been sick for a long time. What, 38 years? And in John chapter 5, verse 6, if you remember, he said to him, do you want to be made well? I wonder if it was more like the inflection wise, do you really want to be healed? Go, go back and sit down on the edge of the pool if you don't. But he had to challenge him. Do you really want to be made well? But not only the, the sick man, the diseased man, he also challenged the, Jew, the Jews. In John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, it says, you search the scriptures For in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. You're not willing to come. That's the same question that the Lord would ask you this morning. Are you willing? Willing to what? Willing to do whatever it is that he has laid upon your heart. Whatever it is that he has called you to do. Are you willing to do that? Are you really willing? John opened the gospel with this truth, his gospel. And in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Again, what does it have to do with? It has to do with willingness. Are you willing to let God radically change your life? Are you willing to let him work in you and through you and for you in ways that you could never imagine? Ways that would just absolutely blow your mind. Are you willing to let him do that? Philosophy is fine to discuss. And sometimes people have real legitimate questions they need answered. But don't hide behind philosophy when the real issue is that you just don't want to give yourself up to God. You just don't want to surrender and give it your life. Are you willing? You remember that verse in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. When chapter 6 is talking about how Israel's lost its way. It's like a mule departed and can't find its way back to the stable. Can't find its way back home. And the Lord begins to reach out. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, let me wash them, and they'll be white as snow. But later on down, there's something really interesting that he says in verse 19. It says, if you are willing, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What a statement. If you're willing... There's no limit to what God can do in your life. There's no limit to the changes, positive guys, changes that you will be blessed by, that you will fall in love with as he molds you and shapes you into the image of himself and is able to do that work within you. So if you're willing, guys, and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, then you shall be devoured by the sword. Verse 21 goes on and says, immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. If the Lord has sent you into a storm and then seen you through that storm, don't go back to the same stuff that caused the storm to be sent to you in the first place. Don't get back caught up in those things. Turn away. Say, Lord, that storm almost sucked me in, sunk me. That storm... My marriage almost dissolved. My business almost went under. I almost lost my job. My kids were almost wiped out. It seemed so dark. It seemed so impossible. You know those times, guys. But you came my way and you told me to be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. You said you were still there and you saw me through. Lord, I acknowledge that it's you who sent the storm. And it's you who stilled the storm. 
Therefore, I will not continue on that course for one more day. I'm not going to go there. I give my life to you, Lord. And when you gave him, guys, there's no ending given. Give him your all, your everything. And so where they were going, they arrived at Capernaum. And notice it says, they arrived immediately. It's like you got hydrofoils or, you know, jets or something. Matthew 14 and Mark 6 verse 51 tells us that when Jesus got into the boat, that the wind stopped as well. Mark records in chapter 6 verse 51, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they marveled. Matthew records in chapter 14 verse 33, then those that were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Do you want to see God reveal himself to you in ways that will amaze and astound? Guys, get in the boat. Yield yourself to the Lord and watch him do what he says he will do. The disciples fell on their faces. That was their act of surrender. That was their act of giving themselves to the Lord. They fell on their faces in awe before Jesus. Why? Because he is our help in the storm. He is our help in the storm. Mark tells us what Jesus was doing while these men were, what Jesus was taking care of, if you would, while his men were in the storm. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 46, it says, and when they had sent him them away, the, those that were there for the food, he departed to the mountain to pray. Underline that word pray or highlight that word pray. Now when the evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. And then he saw, highlight that word saw in your Bible. We're in Mark chapter 6, verses 46 through 48. Then he saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came. Underline that word or highlight that word, came. So that you have now prayer, pray, saw, and came. And he came to them walking on the sea and he would have passed by them but God had a work to do. What was the work? Pray, saw, and came. Number one, he is praying. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 tells us, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's able to save to the uttermost no matter what the storm of your life is no matter what the storm is that you're going through, he is able to save to the uttermost. And he always lives to make intercession. He is praying for us, guys. When we need help, it's good to get prayer, isn't it? You know, I can't tell you how many people have told me that they're so blessed by the prayer chain that we have and we keep going. And it's an awesome thing to receive that prayer and be the recipient of that prayer. It's a good thing to Call a friend and ask for prayer. It's good to put a prayer request in the agape box. It's also really, really good to know that Jesus himself is praying for you. That's the only reason that we make it in life, guys. Jesus is praying for us. He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding day and night. Amen? That is good stuff. But not only is he praying, he is also, also watching. And so we have prayer, we have saw, and then we have came. Saw, he's watching. We wonder, maybe perhaps what's taking him so long. Where'd the Lord go? Where is he now? But he knows what he's doing, guys. And he sees you. Psalm chapter 121, verse 4 through 5. Indeed, he is who watches over Israel. Never, he never slumbers and he never sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. And then, like I said, the last one is coming. He hasn't left you alone. Help is on the way. When the time is right, guys, he will be there. And so to wrap this thing up, 
teacher walked into the third and fourth grade Sunday school class just in time to hear one of the students pray. Dear God, nine-year-old said, bless our mothers and fathers and our sisters and brothers and bless the teachers. And oh, by the way, God, take care of yourself because if anything happens to you, we're sunk. This text that we're looking at this morning makes it clear that Jesus is unsinkable. Wouldn't you agree? He's unsinkable. Truly our Lord and our friend is our Savior in the storm who will come when the hour is the darkest, when the danger is the greatest. But I also want you to be reminded of something else here. And that is that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior in the storm, but he's also the what? Sender of the storm. For in Matthew's account of the same story, Jesus commanded the disciples to go across the Sea of Galilee, even though a storm would be coming. Remember Matthew? You say, well, why would Jesus be the sender of the very storm that you're going through presently? Well, how does that work? Why would he allow the wind to rise? Why would he allow the storm to surge and the waters to get rough? Why, why would he do that? Why would he allow the waves to beat on our little boat? And to that, I want to offer four reasons why Jesus Christ, our captain, our savior in the storm, is also the sender of the storm. Reason number one, he sends the storm to give us new direction. Psalm 107, verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts the, up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melt, melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at the wit's end. They're at their wit's end. They then cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distress. The Lord creates storms for the purpose of causing sailors to come to their wit's end. To come to the place where they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And to see the Lord prove himself in their life. These are all scriptures that you should have down on paper and taped to your bathroom window or mirror. So you can be reminded of the faithfulness of God to see you through. But he creates these storms to cause us to come to our wit's end. In times of pride or in times of self-importance, we think I'm the captain of my ship and the master of my faith. <sighs> Wrong movie. Mixed movies. And we do that until a storm suddenly and savagely comes into our life. And then we find ourselves calling out to the one for whom we had no time before. We didn't have time previously for him. Nor perhaps did we think that we need him personally. But we know that Paul says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Amen? That's the idea. But it's not always how it works practically. With those who don't respond to his goodness, God needs to deal radically in order to get their attention. Jesus asked, he said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Sometimes the Lord may have to put us in a different situation to get our attention because he is, listen, he is more concerned about our eternal state than he is about our present comfort. He would forfeit your present comfort if he knew it would bring about an assurance of your eternal state. 
and you're giving yourself to Him. He sends storms that are designed to bring us to our wit's end, not destroy us, not to kill us, but to bring us to the end of us so that He can show us what He's desiring to do, that He can bring us to a place that we would call upon Him and, and really receive that change within our life. Secondly, He sends storms to give us necessary correction sometimes. Amen? Oh. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, good example. And said, I cried by reason of mine inflection unto the Lord. And He heard me out of the belly of, the, of hell, and I cried. And you heard my voice, for you have cast me into the deep and in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy bellows and thy waves passed over me. God wanted to use Jonah, didn't he? Greatly he wanted to use him there in Nineveh. But Jonah found a ship going in the opposite direction. It's interesting how that works. You ever notice that? Whenever you want to backslide, Whenever you want to turn tail, whenever you want to sail in the opposite direction, guess who is in port with a ship ready to go? Who is it? Satan never says, you want to go backslide? Great. Where's the ship? He doesn't have to say, where's the ship? He knows exactly what it is. He doesn't say, hey, somebody give me a ship here. I need a ship. He's already got the ship in port. He's already got the engines revved. The sails are set. Right now, Satan has a ship waiting for you if you want to jump on it. But the problem is, like Jonah, you're going to pay the price. Right? A man was telling me about his diet and he seemed that the Lord had spoken to his heart about cutting down and not going as crazy as he had been. But one day, he thought it might be God's will to have a donut. And so the man went on to say, I I asked God to give me a parking spot right out front of the donut shop if it was his will. And sure enough, after only the fifth time around the block, there was a parking spot right in front of the donut shop. Maybe some of you guys are circling the block right now saying, well, Lord, if you want me to get involved with him or, Lord, if you want me to go there. Guys, it'll probably happen because Satan always has a ship ready. He always does. But know this. If you're running from God or trying to rationalize what you know is not his best for you. A storm is sure to follow. Number three, Matthew 14, 21 again, and they they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. The people we know by looking at it, they had been fed miraculously. And now they wanted Jesus to rule them politically. Knowing this would sound like the moment his disciples had been waiting for. And I think, bottom line, we, we speculated a little bit, but that brought us to this point. That probably makes a lot of sense. All these people, you know, let's king him. Let's, let's give him a throne. Give him a you know, we're ready for this. We're, 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 this is what we've been waiting for. And the disciples had been. They, they were waiting for Jesus to step in and take over. Waiting for him to take and, and the rule, you know, for himself, the kingship. And waiting, they realized that this would be a fulfillment of their dreams, man. This would be, This is awesome. And so I think Jesus probably, the real reason is he sent them away for their own protection to prevent them from doing something so incredibly stupid 
that it would have destroyed their lives and many other lives to push Jesus in that direction. A fire department received a shipment of high-tech helmets. They were brightly colored, scuff-resistant, adjustable straps. They were incredible works of art, complete with a $500 price tag. There was just one problem. They melted when they got near to heat. Likewise, the Lord has to say to you and me, you're getting your house together and your car is all shiny. You're involved with this gadget and that gizmo, this hobby and the other activity. But you know what? They're not going to take the heat. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. When our lives are tested with fire at the judgment seat of Christ, that which is wood, hay, stubble is going to burn. Only that which is gold, silver, and precious stones will remain. So what does the Lord do? He says, to get your mind off the material world, I'm going to send you into a storm where you will wrestle with issues, struggle with difficulties. Know this, though, that I'm going to be watching over you, praying for you, living right inside of you. But it's a struggle that you're going to have to go through in order that your focus can be shifted from the temporal to the eternal. And then number four, reason why he sends storms. He sends storms in order to nurture perfection. God wants, believe it or not, you to be perfect as he is holy. And it's not a, necessarily a bad thing, depending on what you do with it. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day. For it was now evening tide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about five thousand. Five thousand people accepted the Lord. Wouldn't that be great? We'd have to have everybody out in the parking lot or something. But after feeding five thousand people, Jesus sent his disciples into the storm while he ascended a mountain, Matthew chapter 14. I believe he did this to prepare them for the time that he would ascend not to a mountain, but all the way up to heaven. You see, in Acts chapter 4, another crowd of 5,000 appears, not being fed, but being saved. And immediately after the 5,000 were saved, a storm of persecution broke out, so brutal that the disciples were cast into prison. It's for this reason that I believe the storm they went through in John for a couple of hours on the Sea of Galilee was simply preparatory. You say preparatory for what? Preparatory for what would happen in the storm of persecution that would follow in the book of Acts. Read it. Our captain our Lord and Savior. He sees what tomorrow holds. That's why he says, as difficult as this might seem, it is absolutely necessary to prepare you and perfect you for what's coming. Amen? That's so important. Don't get mad. Don't get upset when you're going through trials, when you're going through storms. It's all preparatory preparing us for our home that he's preparing for us what is this preparation for well 
as difficult as it might seem. It was necessary for the disciples to be prepared and to be perfected for what came. Suffice it to say, there were storms that I went through previously that were absolutely necessary for the storms that would follow a decade later. Guys, the storms you and I are going through presently are necessary to enable us to navigate what lies ahead. So what should we do? Should we freak out? Should we give up? Should we turn back? Should we jump in Satan's boat? Should we take a ship in the opposite direction? No, 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 and no. Right? We should follow the example of the disciples. Embrace the storm, stay the course, and know that Jesus will appear to us at exactly the right moment and say in our ear, it is I, be not afraid. So fellow sailors, be of good cheer and rejoice that the sender of the storm is also our savior in the storm because without him, we would all be sunk. Amen? Father, we love you. We just thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you for, Lord, the assurance. of knowing that we don't have to have point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on and so on. But the Lord, we can truly just trust in you with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. But in all of our ways, acknowledge you knowing that you will direct our paths. That's the promise that, Lord, you've given to us. Help us to apply that promise to our lives. Lord, you are so good and you have done so much to ensure that, Lord, we would Experience that victory that you've already secured. And that, Lord, even in the storms, you've got that all figured out as well. Help us, Lord, not to make it any more difficult than those trials are, but to learn the lessons principles, the precepts, the statutes. That, Father, we might be able to as as little pain, sorrow, and suffering as possible learn what it is that you're teaching us. And to you be the glory, the honor, and the praise forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Ushers, if you'd gather, we'll continue to worship the Lord.
thousand generations falling down in worship sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us all who will be here sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all power and position your name stands above them all and the angels cry song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Sing the song forever and amen, and the angels cry. Father, you are holy. 
And your desire is that we would be holy as well. We pray for that sanctifying process, Lord, that you would work in us sanctification. That, Father, you would mold us and shape us. Use us, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Even in this tithe and offering to you, Lord, take it, multiply it, and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for allowing us the privilege to give back to you that which you've given to us, knowing that, Lord, we could never outgive you. And Lord, be with the sheep now as they go their way. Let them be a testimony and a witness to your goodness and your grace. Bring people in their path. Lord, encourage them just to invite them to church. And Lord, just pray that you would cause your growth as you deem fit. 5,000 or 5. Make us ready to be your servants, your under rowers. And we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise both now and forever. And all of God's people said, love one another, guys. Hang out. Be blessed.